You are most welcome to this talk and uh, a warm welcome back to Professor Angus uh, Dalgleish. Professor, thank you so much for, for coming back. You're welcome. Delighted. Now, for the last uh, 24 hours or so, I've been trying to uh, uh, unpick your <laughs> rather excellent paper uh, written with... Uh, uh, you, can you pronounce the, his name correctly? Y M Lai? Wei Lu, we call him. Wei, Wei Lu, okay, yeah. yeah. That you've, who's uh, more the lab scientist and you're the clinician. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, naltrexone at low doses and, and its relevance to cancer therapy. So if we start with the naltrexone story, I mean, basically, this is one of those um, repurposed drug therapies which seems to be immensely efficacious that is simply not being used because the clinical trials aren't really there at a large scale. The clinical trials aren't there at a large scale because um, no one's paid for them. Big Pharma's not picking it up because there's no money in it. Mm. And it seems to me that this is one of those complete scandals. I mean, we, we, we've talked about your Mycobacterium vacai mm. IMM 101 preparation before, and mm. we'll maybe mention that later on. It just, it's, there's something deep inside me that's outraged but by these obvious things that people like you have identified and and yet sim simply aren't being done so uh, um, I've, I've traced the naltrexone story back a bit it, uh, 1963 it was developed for treating opioid um, uh, addiction basically uh, opiate use disorder I think we would now call it mm. And, and that follow, follows on uh, naloxone, which was the first one, which goes back to 1961. But the naloxone had to be injected, where, whereas naltrexone was, um, was uh, orally available. So what is the story about naltrexone being used for opiates and, and the higher dose? And how did you come to realise the potentially huge benefits of the lower dose naltrexone? Well, thank you for letting me uh, t tell you how I discovered it, because, it's, again, it's very important. I didn't mm. discover it from other doctors. I didn't discover it from uh, uh, any textbooks, any journals, anything like this. Mm. Mm. I discovered it from a patient who I said, you are doing incredibly well. She had been on a, uh, a vaccine program which had been curtailed uh, because the company had stopped the vaccine. But we're talking months later when she had a uh, stage four melanoma, I would have expected to have progressed. She was, not only was there, there no evidence, everything had regressed and she was doing really well. And I said, you know, tell me everything you're taking. So she said, what you told me was actually vitamin D and yep. uh, aspirin, green tea, the things that mm. uh, we thought were very useful support. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I said, well, Thank you, but something tells me there's some, you're taking something else. And uh, you just had that clinical intuition. That, yeah. The next time she came out, she said, "I'm terribly sorry. I should have told you, but uh, you know, I was told it wasn't an anti-cancer thing, and I'm taking low dose naltrexone from a clinic in New York." So I said, um, uh, "What's that? I regard naltrexone as something we use for opiate." Mm. Uh, overdoses addictions etc she says yes that is it and i got it from a dr bihari there so rather than just dismissing this i said uh, you know where is it published and what can i get hold of it and uh, she said well you must go to the clinic next time you're in new york so i actually did and uh, i went there i had read a lot about this and i was very suspicious I mean, you, you, you are, aren't you? It's, it, it, sa it sounds preposterous. It sounds preposterous. But, but I, great that you had the curiosity yeah, to follow that through. Yeah. And I was brought up in a, a, a pharmacology department in UC under a chap called Professor Lawrence. And, uh, you know, he was the, the great guiding light. And everything was the more the merrier. Mm. <laughs> of course. You, you give yeah. everything till it starts getting toxic and you bring it back a bit and then that's that's the dose. Give, give twice as much it's bound to do twice the amount of good <laughs> exactly <laughs> which is, yeah. isn't true by the way but that's the that's the philosophy so this dose of 200 milligrams which is the standard mm. i found that a lot of people who got curious were using it they all said it doesn't work if you give more than 4.5 milligrams not four not five but 4.5 and they'd independently come across this so how was it discovered it was discovered because dr bahari was in charge of the addiction program in new york and 
When they've successfully got people off morphine and heroin, this type of drug, you just uh, reduce the dose and you tail off. And he was surprised at the number of people who asked to go back on the low dose after they'd come off it. Mm. Now, a lesser doctor would have suspected this is some kind of trickery to get uh, back on some opiates of some kind. Yes. And, but he was very good. He said, why? And they said, because I've got arthritis or Crohn's or multiple sclerosis. And it definitely improved on the low dose. It wasn't there at the high doses. So he did the obvious thing. He put them back on and objectively monitored and came to the conclusion that this was real. He then uh, contacted a uh, scientist called Zagon, uh, who started to look at it in the laboratory and noticed that the low dose led to changes in the uh, nocturnal release, the circadian rhythm of uh, endocrine and immunological peptides. And it was always thought it was much better to give it uh, at night to enhance this mechanism. And indeed, I mean, that's the way it's been given. And then I was surprised, um, as, as usual, to, to find that this, there is evidence in the literature that it is effective in Crohn's disease and multiple sclerosis. But as usual, and they're randomised, there's a couple of randomised trials of this, showing benefit, and as usual... The regulatory authorities say, well, this, these studies are too small. You need much bigger ones. I mean, it's the same old nonsense. I mean, this is a licensed drug. It should have been... Uh, what I'm really pushing for is basically that these, these agents are, are licensed for you know, post-marketing uh, um, authentication. So it means I want it so you can write the script and... Every month, these things are renewable monthly usually, you just check that everything's okay, and then every three months, whether there's any objective mm. benefit. That's, that's so, d d just to clarify that, Gus, so what was happening is uh, d Dr. Bihara was like tapering off the dose. Yes. And they found out when it was just at the edge of the taper they were getting these beneficial effects, and he had the, 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 uh, the, the astute clinician's mind that said, yes. ah, ah. Yeah, he, he just really... Just a minute. Yeah, he, he really, I just thought he, he was really great because I know many other people who would have just dismissed this. Yeah, place, uh, placebo, there were loads of junkies uh, anyway. Yes. Yeah, so anyhow, yeah. back, to, back to my mm. uh, cancer patients, uh, ha having uh, seen this, I was faced in my line of work doing oncology with people who run out of every option, but they're not yeah. quite ready for palliative care. Mm. And they're, they're in this uh, twilight zone. Mm. So... I started to give low-dose naltrexone to these people on the ground. It was sort of informed consent, and they've got nothing else, I'll try it. So you could, you could basically prescribe that compassionately. So, so, so naltrexone was already authorised for opiate and alcohol use disorder. Yes. So I was using it off, off uh, label, basically, yes. so I'm allowed to do that. And so that, that's, comp that's compassionate prescribing, yes. isn't it? And any doctor's allowed to do that, yeah. but then they get hounded by people, pharmacists, hospital directors, uh, whatever it is, their practice, etc., that it's not properly licensed. But basically, I didn't care because I was really wanting to help these people. There was nothing else. And then the first, uh, the first sign and evidence that something really good was going on, I gave it to people who got multiple secondaries in the liver from colon cancer, etc., and run out of every option, is they basically uh, said, I I've run out, can you give me another prescription? I, I said, oh, by the way, you think it's helping? Oh, I feel so much better. And this would go on, uh, repeat, repeat, and I suddenly find that these people were, do were doing over a year uh, on the low dose naltrexone. I must add, they were also on, you know, the vitamin D and all the other sensible things. But it, it started to make me think uh, there really is something going on. And then I saw a couple of actual responses, which were quite remarkable. And I thought, wait a minute, you don't get responses like this from altering the uh, circadian rhythm of uh, mm. peptides and the scientific um, evidence presented was modulation of opiate receptors yeah. and clearly it matches but then I became suspicious uh, why is there such a big uh, difference between 4.5 and higher uh, is it doing something else that the high dose is not doing 
So this actually, I must say, this, this was actually really quite exciting because I found somebody who was a classical immunologist. It was very, very, very classical. And uh, they had heard me talk about the low-dose naltrexone and they came to see me and said, I'm very interested in this. How do you think it works? And I said, I don't I fully understand why. I don't believe it's due to opiate receptor modulation. I said, why do you ask? Why are you interested? And she said, my mother had lung cancer. And uh, the local doctor there put her on low-dose naltrexone. And she did 18 months after they expected her to go. So I honestly think there is something. So I said, well, my hunch is there's another receptor involved. It's not the opiate receptor. And uh, I came from a very good background of this because I discovered the CD4 receptor for HIV and you know I did it a totally different way from what anybody else would do it I basically this is the, this is the receptor on, on yeah, the T health cell yeah. I threw a fishing net of every available receptor I could and devised assays that I could detect activity so we did exactly the same uh, with the low dose naltrexone and it was quite amazing after the first two or three you know throwing the fish out nothing comes back and it was about the third time we came back and there was a hit on a thing called TLR9. Now, TLR9 is just an activation receptor on the immunological cells. But when it's activated, it produces IL-6, interleukin-6, discovered after interleukin-5. But they also gave a clue as to what it did in the, uh, the, the nickname they gave it. They called it can uh, the cancer growth factor. So here we had something that was blocking the pathway that produced interleukin-6 cancer growth factor. Yeah. So right, right. Can, can I just clarify and make sure I've got this? Because the, 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 the couple of things I want to just stress, stage four melanoma and, and liver metastases that we talked about, I mean, that mm. is, a, you might as well get the death certificate out. Mm. I mean, that is, mm. it doesn't get any more serious than that, does it, in terms mm. of cancer? These are remarkably serious terminal yeah terminal stages of cancer so so the response that you've got in those conditions is astounding 